Welcome back, everyone, to Never Stay Dead. Oh, we're back with episode two. I am Damien, and I'm joined by... Hello, Internet. This is Matthew. <laughs> Matthew? I've never heard you oh. call yourself that before. Magical Matt. I'll call you Matthew from now. Oh, my gosh. It's like I'm growing up. Wasn't Matthew a uh, bird or something in Sandman? He was a bird. It's also the first book of the Bible. Well, Matthew? Of the New Testament, maybe. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's not Genesis. That's true. Genesis by Matthew. I'll think of it that way. <laughs> so we're way off track. Today, we are going to discuss the graphic novel, I Kill Giants, by Joe Kelly and... Where's his name? J.M. Ken Naruma. Naruma. Or Nimura. Nimura. J.M. Ken Nimura. Nim- Nimura. If anyone wants to challenge us on um, the pronunciation, we will gladly accept it. Which, when we decided to uh, chat about this, we did not realize was coming out as a movie. That's true. Actually, I just mentioned that we were going to talk about this earlier on Twitter, and someone informed me that there was a movie that was just released. <laughs> so, we're trendy by accident. <laughs> And I was halfway through reading it when I realized it was a movie. And I think that affected my reading of it. But um, And my cover, in fact, the cover of my version has a scene from the movie. But it's so kind of photoshopped that I thought I was going to re- be reading this really realistically illustrated color comic. And then I open up the inside and it's a black and white kind of indie kind of uh manga style art yeah it is and i i I gotta say um i i just want to put this up front because there's no way i can even talk about the beginning of this book without talking about the big reveal i'm not a big fan of this but if you don't want this story ruined for you it's one trade go read it come back because we're just going to dive right into the churn because it's impossible to talk about this there's no way to talk about it without talking about the whole thing right um and it's a pretty simple story uh at its root right Um, yes it is when you cut away all the fat right um so uh, do you want to just start with general impressions well do you want to a quick summary? Uh, do you oh. want to summarize it, or shall I quickly summarize it? Why don't you... Since we're talking about spoiling it. Yeah, why don't you try to quickly... Okay, s- I, I think I'm pretty good at boiling these things down. Okay. So, uh, not to toot my own horn too much, but um, it's basically about a sort of weirdo girl, in the sense of nerdy weirdo girl, who loves D&D, who goes around telling people, I kill giants, and gets into all kinds of trouble at school, and is bullied and doesn't fit in and she has this weird home life and she really believes that she's going to fight giants it seems um and they're the giants are these huge monsters that kind of relate to greek mythology and the titans and all of that and she makes friends with another girl who's new to school i think and but then complications ensue and eventually she does fight the giant only probably it's a tornado, um, depending on how you want to interpret the book. And and it turns out that all along what she was doing was in denial of the fact that her mother was dying of cancer. But that fact is sort of hidden from us till near the end of the book, Right? you say? Or did I just miss that No. until it, we got near the end of the book? I, I feel, okay, yeah. So I feel this book's written away. You're supposed to tell that there's something else going on you know there's right. some other factor but it, it's literally just blurted out near the end right i kind of thought there was like a mentally ill brother or uh you know i thought there was something about a brother in a room but it was i guess her mother was like because well, there upstairs? is a, yeah there is a scene earlier where they have another family member that she has this to the tat with and it's doubly weird because the family life is framed that her sister is raising the two younger kids and she's one of the younger kids. Barbara is the main character. And so you get this sense that something else is happening. And then they also do this bit where, um, when she's talking, when Barbara's talking to the school counselor, 
they 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 talk but they censor when you assume they're talking about family names so you can't right. draw any connections there and so right. and there's was something about the father but we only realized towards the end the father has deserted the family i thought maybe the father was also somewhere in the picture but he was ill i i couldn't you know it was uh the family situation for some reason they wanted to hide bits of the family situation from us either that or it was some some sort of failure between the communication between the artist and the writer to make things clear enough well and so there's something of a gender balance here because barbara is a total tomboy she plays D D. she knows about baseball but refuses to play or you know pass a pe or any of that right and i thought like you did talking about the father that like she knew this stuff because her father was a huge giants fan but that she refused to play it because she associated baseball with him so she had this knowledge right. about the giant killer which is something she locked into right and they also do uh, something similar with it later where she's talking about um, Giants with Sophia, the friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, she talks about how the Giants them themselves aren't cool. What they do is terrible. But there's facts about them that are fascinating. Right. Kind of the way like a hunter would talk about their prey. Like they know it in and out. So they know the facts. And they're fascinated by it, but they view it as this terrible thing. Yeah. So there were times when I thought, <clears throat> well, let me say overall, like the, this is originally seven issues and now it's seven chapters. The first chapter was very hard to get through and then it became very readable. And I read it very fast after the first chapter. In fact, I surprised you when, the next day I said, hey, I just finished it <laughs> um, over Twitter. And uh, <clears throat> but but it seemed like maybe the and, and I like the art grew on me a lot, but it also felt like maybe the artists let us down in a few th ways in terms of like being able to tell how old people were. Like at first I couldn't figure out the older sister thing and whether that was a mother or a sister or who it was or how old she was. Well, and uh, there's this bully in there called Taylor uh, right. who gets into a fight, but then she ends up in the counselor office. But then that first scene with the counselor, she complains about how it'd be less embarrassing if she was brought in any other way. But they don't depict how she came in. And so I thought Tyler brought right. her down, but that would make no sense because she's a school bully, you find out later. So right. I thought she was faculty because she's huge. She's huge. She has... I mean, this is supposed to be fifth grade. I that's maybe another confusing thing about it because yeah. on some level she is like a fifth grade, a ten year old, and on other levels it's very middle school. It feels more like twelve and thirteen, maybe even fourteen year olds. I, and the bully is, you know, a full grown female with hips and breasts and everything, um, and she's about three inches, three feet taller than everyone else, but. Right. Um, yeah, I kept thinking it was middle school, and you're right. They do say it's elementary school, but it doesn't line up with the characters. Right. And I have a daughter in fourth grade right now, and it, unless um, fourth grade and fifth grade are radically different, <laughs> they probably are a bit different, yeah. um, it, this does not line up with, at all with my daughter's experiences. And I don't think you have a... In elementary school, I don't think you have, well, I might be wrong on that, but I don't think you have like a school counselor the way you do in high school or junior high. You have a, you have a team of people who work with kids who have emotional problems or um, learning difficulties is what they usually call them. Um, but it's usually a speech therapist and a occupational therapist and things like that, not a counselor who sits down and chats with you. Well, um, and at elementary school, they tend to treat it differently, too, because the gap's smaller, so they actually do push kids through in different ways and sometimes have more success. Right. So, oh, yeah. And they would, they would actually, if this girl who completely denies reality, they'd probably have a, a whole team of experts working with her. So anyway, I think Joe Kelly, I think he has kids. I think he, I heard him mention that in an interview, but he may have forgotten... <laughs> 
what they're like in junior high versus elementary school or something. I actually, I read in the back material when he wrote this, his kid wasn't even old uh, enough to be at this character yet, and he was projecting forward, uh, and I think he missed the beat. So, um, right. So before your kids have gone through that process, you blur your own memories between grade school, you know, the end of grade school and the beginning of middle school or something. Right. Um, there's a lot, so there's a lot of moments in this book where the scene changes and I felt like something in the scene was unresolved or there's something at the beginning of the next scene that predicates some information that we should have known, but we don't get. And I just feel like this was like, this is the second time I've read this all the way through the third time I've read a portion of it. Um, and I remember the first time I read a portion of it, I wasn't into it. The first time I read it as a trade, I was relatively impressed because it kind of came together in a way I wasn't expecting. Reading it now, though, knowing the twist and kind of looking for a little bit more, it's fallen down for me again. This is... I don't think it's a very uh, well-put-together story. I think if you're going to adapt this, and I'd actually be curious to see the movie, because I think you could take this, I think there's a lot of strengths in the idea of it, Mm -hmm. But I'm willing to bet anyone who's putting it all together could execute it in a much better fashion. Cause well, I think a lot would rest on the actors. You know, in the comic, it rests on the artist. But in a movie, it, it rests on how good the actors are at making us believe these situations. I... Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, any movie is definitely going to need decent acting. I think the director would be the more key point to a lot of the failings of the comic, though, where you're going to have scene transitions that need to make more sense. And you're going to... That's true. You're, you're going to have a chance to draw the action of the book to a better parallel to the emotion of that they're trying to sing through. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was just dropped in this comic. But I wonder if... Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and so it's it, the director and the actors are important. But I'm kind of thinking that at times, maybe even though this art, for me, it took a little bit of adjustment to the style. But once you get used to the style, it's kind of a fun art style. It didn't communicate enough information. I think maybe the writer thought the art was going to communicate some information that it didn't. And that's why sometimes we find ourselves feeling like we're missing some piece of information. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the storytelling in here isn't as strong as it necessarily needs to be at points in that aspect as well. Now, I under I gather this has become kind of a staple of young adult graphic novels. Is that your impression too? What's oh, I I've heard this book mentioned here and there, but I don't know. In my maybe that's more pre movie hype then. Yeah, I like I, I've heard this book mentioned a few times, but for the most part, I thought it was just uh, one of those graphic novels that hung around that people picked up here or there. I, I don't uh -huh. remember it being treated with much reverence after its uh -huh. moment. And then, well, and you and I aren't really part of the young adult reading world at the moment. Um, not anymore. That age is <laughs> catching up to me. <laughs> well, you'll have kids someday, and then you'll know all about it. But like my daughter is on the verge of, re she's still kind of a middle reader and about to go into young adult. Well, I guess this would be middle reader because the character is 10 years old, but it does feel like it's more aimed at people who, who have gone through middle school. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I waffle on whether I think it's a good book or not. I mean, it, it's kind of, and I'm complaining about the art, but if it was more standard art, I think then the schmaltziness of the script would be highlighted, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like I joked with you that it reminded me of an after school special or, you know, one of those Hallmark kind of made for TV movies of the old days. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, she finally fights the monster, which might be a tornado and might really be a monster. Uh, but the monster is there to talk to her about her psychology and accept things. And, you know, like her her monster is, is the therapist all over again in a way. So I read the monster differently than you did. And okay. that might be part of the reason why I'm more down on it. Um, so she has this whole thing about there's giants and she kills them. Not that she just hunts them, but that she kills them. And... When she fights it, it's a titan. It's the big, 
thing. It, it's like unbeatable. And in my mind, it was her emotions surrounding her mother's cancer. Like, and so she goes and she kills it. But what's weird is when she's in the middle of fighting this Titan, the Titan, like, I think the only thing it says other than like, hey, ho, some grunts is, I'm sorry. Um, she says, but I beat you. And he said, I, sorry, I'm going kind of, yeah, yeah. I came for you. I came for you. I know, child. I know. I oh. thought it says some more psychobabble yeah. at some point. After she no, I did not it. come for her. I came for you. I came for you. Yeah, right. No yeah, so, yeah. so I I sort of came to heal you rather than I came to kill your mother. Oh, that's why I didn't read that I earlier today. It. Those pages got stuck together. All right, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but I mean, the Titan has has mouth a mouth mouth sorry, mouths with teeth where its nipples should be, which did really creep me out. Sorry, that was an aside. Oh, no. The, yeah, I had some notes on the Titan design, too. Um, I actually, in the back matter, the artist uh, had all these designs. Joe Kelly made this note that all the uh, giants have uh, little giants and pointed out that uh, in America that's not going to fly as well as in Europe because this guy's more of a European guy because we don't do so with penises. And he said, I don't know, some giant thing grabbing a little girl with its thing hanging out seems scarier to me. And just the way they were talking about this book in general just felt like this kind of raw creative process where they weren't necessarily hammering down the details. And it doesn't really feel like they had an editor. Right. And that's quite possible. A lot of image comics do not have editors. And I feel like that's part of the reason that this book had a lot of these weird moments. Like, I feel like they were so busy about jumping to what they thought was cool in the scene, they forgot about some of the payoff or setup that was needed to kind of make it work for the story. And so... Yeah. Um, I... I mean, I think you're right there. I think a lot of people could read this and see the the strong emotional side of the story and feel satisfied with that. Yeah. We have a, a friend that we both like on Twitter who said it was one of his favorites, right? Yes. Um... So, so it's kind of like when I was in college, <laughs> I often had professors who did not like my writing. Mm -hmm. But twice I wrote things based on going to my grandmother's funeral and suddenly they liked my writing <laughs> and it's kind of a a subject matter thing and so i think the power of this is that joe kelly in this particular book picked a kind of universal subject matter which is the denial of death the loss of your parents um the way that kind of even though everything doesn't line up perfectly in a sense, you know, like there's all these problems with what age she really is and, and information that's left out. When you finally realize what the story really was about, it still does have some impact, even though it's kind of corny and cheesy because it's a good subject to write a story about. There's that. I think that's part of the reason I'm harsher on it though, is we get so many of these stories. That's true. And so when one's, a little more sloppily put together I, I just feel it more um, yeah yeah also this time reading it being older I, I think I sympathized with the adults more in this book this time because uh -huh. <laughs> Barbara's out of control like she's a problem child and I mean they they're empathizing but at the right. same time like how, how many years ago did you read this uh it, it must have been early 2000s like over a decade ago uh-huh so when you were maybe 19 or something i don't think it's even that old because it came out in what this trade came out in 2009 i think okay so it wasn't yeah. anyway you were you probably remembered the teenage emotions more yeah that it taps into even though it's not about a teenager i think there's something also for he is using Joe Kelly, the writer, is using kind of cheap, easy things like being the rejected nerd at school. Mm -hmm. But he does it very slickly. And then you add on this kind of not so slick artwork 
and it makes for it gives you kind of an interesting pathos about this reject character at school who is so into D and D that it's become real in her imagination. Well, yeah, that's part of it too, I guess. Is so when I was growing up and I was around the age more where I think this character would be than where they claim the character is. I I feel. I, I feel a relation to the character because I had a really sick mom going through school and right. I was definitely on the nerdier side of things, though I never did d and I did comics. What a shock. Here we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the way she's acting out, the way she's treating other people is gross and ugly. And I mean, look, if this was uh, your standard stock superhero book, this is the churn, the character moment where you realize this person's going to be a villain instead of a right. superhero. She turns around by the end of the story, obviously, but the way she's acting out, the way she's lashing out, and because she's so young, she's learning the consequences of her actions. I get that. I just, there's so much weird character growth that goes throughout this book. It's hard for me to find her likable until we get to the end of it, at which point she's still a little too... In the butt. It's funny. I when I read it, I thought I would be attacking the book and you would be defending it since you were the one who picked the book out. But now I now I find myself defending it. But I I think that there's a lot of cheap, easy Hollywoodisms here. Okay. You know, the the bully is totally awful, and how could anyone, any adult in this world, stand back and let this happen with this kind of bullying, and all of that kind of thing is just cheap pulling at your emotions um so i didn't think of her as someone who would turn into a supervillain, but i suppose that's possible i yeah i'm not saying she would necessarily i just feel like that's the character turn we'd see if you're going to be starting to write a villain out from right. trauma if you were in a wanted to write about a origin of a villain in a world that actually was a fantasy world but you know he goes for a lot of cheap pathos but cheap pathos works sometimes yeah. pathos pathos i'm not sure which one. <clears throat> so it sort of works and it kind of loses me then it works it loses me and so on and analyzing it afterwards i think it works less than in the moment of reading it if that makes sense and you're reading it for a second time and at a different point in your life right and so i, I think you have some points there and i do want to soften some of what i've been saying because i've been a bit overly negative like there are moments there's definitely a lot of moments that work and i i think the moments are nifty and we we see this character in a lot of different points and this is like the down point of her life basically especially thus far um it's just hard to reconcile the fact that we have this interesting character that's supposed to be relatively intelligent though right it's kind of like yeah, a middle schooler who's fairly intelligent, but not emotionally intelligent at all. Right, and in a sense, emotionally, she's not even 10. I would say emotionally, she's about 6. Right. You know, in terms of her inability to um, to process what's really going on. I would say, from my own observation of 9-year-olds, that a 9- or a 10-year-old is more likely to know what's going on but still kind of act out, if, if you know what I mean, as opposed to block out reality. Um, but I could be wrong on that, you know. And you have to kind of, I don't know, you have to kind of accept things. But knowing that this <clears throat> was coming out as a movie, and knowing that Joe Kelly is one of those writers who moved to Hollywood, you know, he started out as a comic book writer and then moved to Hollywood and he's part of what do you call it? The men of action. Yes. Who've done a lot man of, of um, yeah. man of action. Is that it? Not man, even though there's three of them or something. Yeah. They've done a lot of uh, Hollywood, mostly animated shows. Right. But it's kind of like he's applying all of his Hollywood techniques to comics and, those come first over other storytelling needs or whatever. And and that might be why, because you, like you said, you've gone through a similar thing that she's going through. It all reads as not quite right to you because he's more interested in the Hollywood tropes than delving into his own real emotions or someone's real emotions. Right. Well, so when you go through writing school, 
Uh Um, one of the things they tell you about is when you're writing not your main character but the other characters you need to think about their motivations and how they move through the world basically you want a world that's lived in and not something that revolves around the main character unless you're right doing some everyone's the hero of their own story right more or less yeah and this world revolves around barbara but she's supposed to be an abrasion in it and so I I feel like that's where most of the disconnect for me is. Because, like, Sophia is supposed to be your friend and is probably the best written side character. Mm-hmm. But there's moments in here that I feel like never are resolved in a way that fits for me. Right. There's a moment where uh, Barbara gets into a fight with the bully and accidentally ends up turning around and socking Sophia in the face. And then Sophia's mad at her, and then they do something, and then Sophia turns around and goes to be friends with Barbara again. And there's a bit of a reason why, but I don't felt like it... I didn't feel like it was enough to justify, especially because... It's because Sophia learns that uh, Barbara's mom is dying, and that's why she's acting out. She turns around on it, but that action takes a level of maturity that these right. characters are not supposed to have. So yeah. it's yeah, <sighs> yeah. There's a lot of confusion, and in a way, and this only seeing one one person's point of view, I suppose, is what a middle school kid feels, but it's not. The story is not told close enough to just her point of view to, you know what I'm saying, Mm -hmm. to um, allow for that. The other characters kind of exist separate from her, but are somehow still the way she would see them, if that makes sense. Yeah, I just feel like there's a lot of learning moments I had as a kid who was a snuck-up brat at times that this character doesn't encounter. Like... All throughout, um, she's like in a class reading a book, and she's acting like she's the smartest person in the room, including the teacher. Right. But she's also acting out and getting terrible grades and whatnot. Right. And so the counselor is asking, like, well, if you're so smart, why aren't you getting A's? You know, there's there's no moment like that, no moment of taking all the truths about the character and trying to reconcile some of the conflicts of the reality of the situation with her reality of the situation right which is part of what i mean by like the drama was never played through in a way that felt like it fit um earlier even including you know later with the titan but i felt like the titan needed to be paired with the uh mother but we don't see the mother until after that and so there's a lot of great moments to be had with like seeing the mother, seeing the fights, and getting some kind of, like, connection with between her situation, what's going on with the giant, to kind of play on the idea of, like, is this real? Um, or is that how, she, you know, Barbara's thinking about it? And getting us there with the character through the form just never, never came through like that. Yeah. It's interesting... To, to just as an experiment to read this and see what you know what gets turned into a movie and, and seeing it as a movie might be an interesting thing but um, just out of curiosity right I don't know were you a Joe Kelly fan before this book yes is he the one who is he the one who wrote one of your favorite Deadpool series or is that yeah. the other Joe no no it was uh, Joe Kelly did that Joe Kelly did a lot of Superman stories I like Joe Kelly's done a lot of work I really enjoy this is uh-huh. uh, not that though as much right <laughs> uh, yeah I feel I, I feel somehow like he got sucked too far into Hollywood or something like that but, um... yeah yeah there was another note I had that was on the character design of Barbara. Is all throughout the book she wears these bunny ears. Yes. Uh, kind of like what's her name, Bob's Burgers. Um, <laughs> right. And I don't know her name. Yeah, I can't think of it right now for whatever reason. Um, because I'm terrible with names. That's why. But the reason was is originally um, Joe Kelly wanted this character to have like this crazy red hair or whatever closer. 
mm -hmm. to something what her daughter has, both different colored hair. And then the artist pointed out, well, it's a black and white book, and that's not really going to sing. It's not going to really set her apart. And I really wanted her to feel like she was a character in her world, separate from everyone else who is more the mundane. And there's a bunch of designs here, but I can't help but think, like, I think this book would have flowed better. They had some where she just kind of had some more straight but kind of crazy hair. It feels like it would have fit better. Like, her just wearing bunny ears all the time, and the fact that no one brings that up, especially when she's going in to right. see the psychologist, and she's having a new friend pointing at some of the weird things she does, but finds them charming. Like, how does this never come up? <laughs> I I think because because on some level the book annoyed you 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 pick on it in a lot of extra ways like I I like the bunny ears fine but I, I no I think like it could work I it just... was a fun visual clue or cue that someone is totally out of step with everyone else. You know, is off in her own world. Yeah, it just... And at the uh, end, she does not wear wear bunny ears after accepting her mother's death. She's wearing something else, yeah. Yeah, like a hoodie or something. Yeah, with like a couple... A hoodie with little clown things on it. Yeah, yeah. it's almost like she's now cosplaying. <laughs> yeah, I think it was that. I think it wouldn't have... It, it would have been a little more subtle, at least. I don't know. I just... It's more the fact that they're there yeah. and it doesn't get brought up. Just irked me. But you're right, I think of being nitpicky. No question. But, yeah, I, I suppose if I want to nitpick, the other big nitpick I have is, so she fights the monster, and now that she's fought the monster and somehow magically not drowned in the river, she now accepts her mother's cancer and can go and say goodbye to her mother. Um, why? Why does fighting a monster make you now accept your mother's cancer it's just sort of a cheap hollywoodism right oh yeah okay i fought the monster and the monster told me that i he came for me not for my mom and that soothes my soul but the monster is probably not real right so she's just fighting her in her in her own imagination she solved her problem somehow yeah she fights her inner demons but she's a little kid and her mom's dying of cancer and that's not like right. something you should feel great about. yeah it's, it's yeah I don't know what to make so of that. So it's not a real resolution. It's a pretend resolution. It's it's something that signifies a resolution by fighting the monster. But what does fighting the monster really mean? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. I think the there are some books, the more you talk about them, the more you like them. In other books, the more you talk about them, the less you like them. <laughs> it's true. I think if you read this once, you kind of have a good time and move on. Yeah. Um, you might not think it's your favorite book, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if you hadn't asked me to read it, I would have stopped after issue one. That's what I almost did long ago. <clears throat> I got issue one the day it came out. I read through it, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty amazing that given it was published in issues, there was nothing in the first issue to set you up to be interested in what's coming because it didn't give you enough information. Yeah, it's crazy to think at the time the market was way different because, I mean, Image maybe had some stuff coming out, but it was right. usually miniseries. <clears throat> well, it was also the period, and this was a miniseries, the period when um, the one advantage the one thing about creator own things was you might sell it to the movies. Not that you would sell very many comics, but you might sell it to the movies. Yeah. And I think this might be a prime example of people saying, you know, they don't like these comics that are done as movie pitches. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely could see that. Okay. Well, I'm guessing next time we'll, We'll go back to some kind of superhero comic, perhaps where someone comes back from the dead. <laughs> Stay on brand. Right, right. So in this one, death was real. Yeah. His, her mother's not coming back. Well, until I kill giants too. Right, right. <laughs> if the movie is a big hit. <laughs> 
there's a little part of me because of the way the cover looked that is sad that I didn't read a book about a, a, a whole lot of real giants being killed by a little girl. I think that would have been more fun. <laughs> okay, well, I think we will sign out there and um, we will be back soon with episode three of Never Stay Dead. Ooh.